Network Television proudly presents the 1986 Goodwill Games from Moscow and from Madrid. Good evening and welcome to late night coverage of day 13 of the Goodwill Games of 1986. What an interesting day it's been at the World Basketball Championships that we've been bringing you coverage from in Spain and Madrid. The United States earned a right to play for the gold by defeating Brazil 96-80. And then in one of the most spectacular and interesting comebacks I've ever seen in a basketball game, the Soviet Union trailing Yugoslavia by nine points with 46 seconds left hit three three-point shots, denying Yugoslavia one single point, tied the game, sent it into overtime, and won 91-90, and the confrontation the world has been waiting for in basketball, the U.S.-USSR, will happen on Sunday, and we'll bring it to you. It'll happen in the Sports Palace in Madrid, Spain, in front of some of the most frantic fans I've ever witnessed at the 18,000-seat capacity uh, Sports Palace in Madrid. What a ball game we had today. The United States won relatively easily over Brazil, but the Soviet Union had one of the great comebacks, so that'll be a great matchup coming up. On this late-night hour, we'll be taking a look at boxing with the semifinal action, also covering yachting from Tallinn Bay, and Bart Connor is here to talk about gymnastics and about the Goodwill Games. We'll get to all of that in just a moment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Even as the inaugural Goodwill Games are reaching their concluding days, plans are already underway for the 1990 Games, and as you probably have heard already, Seattle has won the right to be the host city for the Games of 1990. Seattle, Washington, and the chairman of the host committee, Father William Sullivan, who's also president of Seattle University, has been in Moscow observing. He's going to be with us tonight to chat a little bit about the Games of 1990, has some interesting ideas for the Games in Seattle. But right now, Bart Connors with us, and he's going to be with us for the entire hour. Bart, good to see you again. Glad to be here. First thing I want to say, you're looking a whole lot better uh, <laughs> sartorially. Well. Is that right, sartorially? I think it is. That was good. That just came out of nowhere. Then when you arrived and they'd lost your trunk, I guess they found your clothes. Yeah, I got my clothes and... Uh Actually, I, I was really glad to have my clothes, but I think the people I've been working with for the last few days were even gladder that I have my clothes. I noticed a lot more folks are working with you now than when you first <laughs> yeah. got here. That's great. <laughs> that we've been watching your, your coverage, which, by the way, uh, this is the kind of thing you don't always say, but I want to say it to you. Your coverage, your enthusiasm, and your uh, uh, reporting of the gymnastics has been excellent. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. We've been had watching a nice it. time out there. Thank uh, you. You and Kathy Johnson, Charlie Neal. Now, the gymnastics. Soviets have dominated oh. unquestionably. My question is, is are they that good or everybody else that weak? Uh, the point is, is that they are that good. Uh, it's not only the Americans, but uh, it's the East Germans, the Chinese, the Romanians. They, I don't know what it is about the Soviet team. It's not that we don't work hard, mm -hmm. but uh, they have an unbelievable system. It's like a machine, a factory of just running these gymnasts through. And, and, and they're so, they have such great uh, virtuosity in the performances, such great amplitude, such great extension. I don't know what it's going to take for the Americans to compete with them. They, uh, they have it nailed, the whole sport. What do you do if you're the U.S. gymnastics team, men and women, and we're not finished with the women's competition yet, I don't want to write them off by any means, but, but from early indications, it's, I don't say anybody's going to beat the Soviets. What do you do to get, to get, to get ready for 88 uh, in Seoul, to get ready for 90 in Seattle? What? Well, one thing we're lacking, as I think with many of the other teams around the world, is that we don't quite have the depth that the Soviet Union has. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, really the numbers of kids that are involved in the sport, and I, I know that when you have those kind of numbers to feed into the top groups, that you're going to have the top gymnasts that are really going to filter out and come to the cream of the crop. Uh, the U.S. gymnastics program, we're doing well. We're in a rebuilding stage. We've lost so many of the Olympians from 84. Uh, they're all retiring, and uh, we're trying to bring in a new group, and they have to get that valuable international experience, and so that's what they're here trying to do. You have a piece of videotape we're going to look at with uh, Joyce Wilburn yeah. and her performance. Let's get that rolling. It's a uh, performance on the vault, on as the I understand. Vault. Talk she about this great. a little bit. Joyce is from New Jersey, and she's one of our youngsters. She is a very explosive on floor exercise and vaulting. Here's a vault from tonight's competition. Look at that. Mm. A perfect laid-out Sukahara with a full twist. That scored her a 9.9. .9. And the exciting thing about this is that, of course, she'll be in the vaulting finals in two days. We're looking forward to her efforts there because she really is one of our strongest hopes for the Western world to win a medal in gymnastics. And she's outstanding in vaulting. We hope she can do it. She can do it. There was a 10, Yelena Shushanova. 
Yeah. The Soviet Union. Uh, yeah. Did you did you agree with the fact that it was a perfect? Day? Well, you know, we've talked about the fact that the judges have completely changed their rules over the last few years, and it's very difficult to get a ten. We sat there tonight and watched this exercise, and, and she is a rock. Uh, she just blasts through a routine. She's very aggressive, and she gives way to no deduction. So, I mean, if we had to see a ten tonight, it was that routine on the uneven bars. Sushinova. How about the controversy that we've heard from some of the athletes, and more from the press maybe than the athletes about? the uh, the equipment, the apparatus, about the floor, about the mats. Has it been that big an effect on scores in your view? Well, I tell you, it's, it was actually kind of funny because we laughed the first day. The mats on vaulting were sliding all over the place. And so some of the guys from the Soviet delegation came out and they taped all the mats together so they wouldn't slide all over the floor. I went out there and took a look at it and it said Moscovia, general, g genuine Russian vodka on the tape. That's what was holding <laughs> the mats together. But I asked Yuri Korolev. probably Korlyev, the very best there is. Uh, I'm sure it was, you know. But I asked Yuri Korolev, who won seven medals, five of them gold. I said, uh, what, what do you think about the mats? And he said, um, well, you know, for, for bad gymnasts, it's bad conditions, but for good gymnasts, uh, it doesn't really matter. And so I guess that said the story. Reminds me of the old Jimmy Connors during his uh, prime playing tennis when he said, I can beat anybody in the world with a 695 racket. Tough stuff. <laughs> I wanted to say, I've got a 695 racket. You can beat me. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you about any of your personal experiences that you've had this week. You've been obviously working very hard covering gymnastics, but when you first came, you had just arrived. Uh, how's it been? What's happened? Any stories for us we might find out? Well, first of all, you know, the gymnastics competition has been outstanding. We've been working all night long, which is something I'm getting used to, you know, living on like U.S. time, but still living here in the Soviet Union. We've had a great time. In fact, last night we went to this wonderful <coughs> restaurant. Uh, some kind of bazaar. I forgot the name of it. Maybe you've been there. I've been there. I, can't, I couldn't pronounce it then. Oh. <laughs> Slavonsky Bazaar. bazaar. That's Ken Fouts, our producer, it's has the answer to everything. It's a very happening he place. He must have been there. <laughs> we had some vodka. We had some champagne. We had a wonderful time. We met a lot of nice Soviet Caviar. people. Caviar. In fact, caviar. This is great. They have pancakes. Mm -hmm. You lay sour cream on top of that. A little caviar, roll it up like a caviar burrito and eat it. It was good a stuff. A caviar burrito. Yeah, stuff. Let's open a stand after the games. I Want think we to should. in Seattle? Okay. Caviar burritos, it'd be big in Seattle. Okay. We could promote it for four years. You <laughs> I'll and I. with you. We'll start a company. We could buy in a franchise. Will you stick around for the hour with us? I hope you will. Happy we have to. a lot to talk to you about. And we'll continue in just a moment. Please stay with us as we continue with the Goodwill Games from Moscow. Differences in the similarities in Moscow and New York and the Soviet Union, the United States. And Moscow is similar to New York in a lot of ways. It's a big urban city. People walk a lot here, much as you would in Manhattan. Uh, take the subway and walk and drive their cars and get taxis. To walk the streets of Moscow has proved to be very ex interesting. It's a very different experience than walking in a big American city in so many ways. CNN's Richard Blystone found that one of the differences is in the faces of the people themselves. And here's his report. One of the first things you notice here is the faces. Any time of day on the streets of Moscow, you get the idea that here is a nation chronically deprived of its morning coffee. Stern, forbidding faces that speak of hard times and distrust. The cliche Russian does exist. Are they imitating the expressions of the heroes on the posters? in the statues. Try smiling them down. You could wind up with the same expression yourself. But just when you're about to give up, the clouds roll by and the smiles come out. Catch the Russians with their families and their friends, and it's like summer busting out after eight months of winter. And all the more welcome because you thought it wasn't possible. foreseeable political event is going to take the winter from the Russian faces. But then, well, maybe the children. Maybe the kids. 
For the Goodwill Games, I'm Richard Blystone. Richard Blystone, usually CNN's London correspondent, his first extended visit to Moscow, so his experiences are firsthand, much like his, his reactions are much like those of any of us who were here for the first time. And he, like so many of the rest of us, are so overwhelmed by the Soviet children and the feeling of the Soviet people toward their children. It was the biggest surprise and a very pleasant one. It's something that'll make you, uh, make you smile when you see the people in Moscow. We've been covering yachting now for six days of yachting. They started off with very rough, difficult weather up on the Baltic Sea in Tallinn Bay, but things got underway and the competition is going hale and hearty. Let's go to Gary Jobson at Tallinn Bay. We have been following Kathy Steele closely this week. After four races, she stood second. Although only five feet tall, she has lots of spunk. I started out as a gymnast mainly because I was small and that, that I thought was going to be my, my sport. And it was for a long time. Then my dad taught me how to sail when I was very young. And um, first I didn't like it. He always was dragging me away from my friends and my gymnastic meets and I didn't like it. But then um, um, after a while I started to like sailing a lot. And my dad and I and my family had a really, a lot of really good times out in the boat. And then um, when I saw Scott out sailing at college on a windsurfer, that looked like the perfect thing to do. It was like gymnastics and sailing all in one thing. And I knew right from the minute I saw that, that that was something that was going to be for me. The way she trains and her whole attitude about this about the sport is, is great and, and she um, she's you know she's worked her way to the top and she, she went from like you know one level to the next and she finally got up there and now um, you know she's gonna stay there for a while I think that she could be the top woman sport sailor in this country until 1990 running is really relaxing for me I um, get up every morning and go for a nice nice long run with my radio and sometimes Scott, and uh, that really relaxes me. I can think about things that I want to do, and I think about my sailing also, and what I want to do there in that aspect. Scott and I used to, to go out on Sunday afternoons and sail, just to sail, and we got, used to go out and do freestyle and things like that. But it's, it's not very often we do that anymore. It's usually to go out and practice a certain thing or for a certain event, and um, it's... It's always fun when we do it, but it's not the same as it used to be when we were in college. You know, we'd, we'd go out and we'd sail this little island and, you know, have lunch or something. It's not like that anymore, but maybe it will be in the future after we get all this competitive stuff out of the way. I hope I'm going to continue to keep getting better. Um, I think physically I'm about as good as I'm going to be. But like I said earlier, I would like to work on relaxation and, and um, in, in mental awareness, I think that will help out a lot. So there, I don't think I'm at my peak. I think in board sailing and yachting, there's, you, you can always learn more. You can always get better. Because there's different conditions I can get better in. I can get better in heavier air and, and things like that. I think you can always get better. And uh, I, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep on getting better. There was lots of traffic today at the start of the women's sailboard division. Fickle winds made the race a guessing game. Kathy Steele of the United States called the light winds a snooze box. But Soviet Julia Kostakova found what little wind there was and took a narrow lead at the fifth mark. At the finish, she won by 10 seconds over Poland's Joanna Brzezinska. Kathy Steele was a little off the pace as she finished third and now stands third overall in the game. As the men's sailboard division started this morning, it's interesting to note how these boats sail. American Mike Gebhardt explained one of these mysteries to me this morning. Mike Gebhardt, sailboards don't have rudders. How do you steer these boats? Well, your sail is your rudder. What it, what it is is when you perfectly you usually have your sail standing straight up, the board is going to go straight. And to change course, since you have a fixed skeg or, or nothing to steer from with the back of the, bo the board, you're going to use your sail. And you do that, you steer by tilting it forward and back. Okay, and what you're doing is you're taking the center effort and, and you know, you're unbalancing the board. So the board's going to turn. 
turn one way or another. So if you move it forward, which way do you steer? You're going to put the center effort in front of the, of the dagger board, and that's going to push the nose off the wind. So if you tilt yourself forward like so. And then total opposite when you tilt it back. Center effort moves behind the dagger board, pushes the stern away from the wind, so you start heading up into the wind. So forward, away from the wind, aft, into the wind. Soviet Yevgeny Bogotrap won his first race today of the games, while American Gebhardt struggled with a cut foot to finish sixth. Bogotrap demonstrates pumping. It should be noted that two days ago, three board sailors were disqualified from the fourth race for illegally fanning their sails. American Buzz Reynolds won the fin start today, but he failed to cover his Soviet and East German rivals. Instead of staying between them and the first mark, Reynolds attempted to stretch his lead by splitting with the opposition, a move that proved to be disastrous. As we have seen so often in the game, Soviet Oleg Kupursky led the fleet, seen here rounding the second mark. He has continued to dominate the class. Today, he won again by 1 minute and 15 seconds. Reynolds came home fifth. Kapursky could wrap up the gold medal tomorrow with a good race. Morgan Reeser and Kevin Burnham, for the third race in a row, found themselves well back just after the start today. They are seen here tacking on the far right. At the second mark of the men's 470 division, the East Germans were winning. But close behind, Americans Morgan Reeser and Burnham. Somehow these men have been brilliant playing the wind shifts to their advantage on the Baltic, although they need a little help with their spinnaker work. By the finish, the Americans were in the lead and took their third straight race. Perhaps they should start last every day if that's what it takes to win. Poland finished second. Reeser and Burnham were happy with their performance. All smiles. Coming off their first victory two days ago, Americans P.Z. Herndon and Cindy Goff went sailing with a renewed confidence in the women's 470 division. East Germany led early but was disqualified for jumping the gun. On the last leg, the Americans took the lead in dying breezes. The Americans were unhappy with their boat in the first three races, but look happy today after their second straight win. In race five today, the Soviet Union won the sailboard women's division, the sailboard men's division, and the fin class, while Americans won both 470 men's and women's divisions. So, some pictures of the yachting and a report from Gary Jobson at Tallinn Bay on the Baltic Sea. Imagine those same kind of yachts and some of those same competitors on uh, Lake Washington near Seattle in 1990 because that's exactly where the yachting venue will take place. And we'll be talking to the chairman of the host committee from Seattle, Father William Sullivan, who's also president of Seattle University, about the 1990 games in just a moment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. With Father William Sullivan now, the president of Seattle University and the chairman of the host committee uh, for the 1990 Games in Seattle. Father, it's nice to have you here. Nice to be with you this evening. Had you been to Moscow before, previously? Yes, I had in uh, about 1975. I was here for a meeting of university presidents, so this is a chance to come back and see this great city again. Why Seattle? What made the folks in Seattle, including yourself, choose to apply to host the Goodwill Games? Well, I think there are several reasons, Bob, one of which is Seattle is a great sports city. It's a city that, that loves sports, loves competition. Also, uh, it is a city with a very definite international dimension. Our, our position uh, on, the, on the Pacific, our relations with a number of cities here in the Soviet Union. So it was a combination of the, the attractiveness of a 
world-class sports competition with what I think is really an international interest uh, among the citizens of Seattle. And you went for these games before the first Goodwill Games happened. They're happening now. They are a reality, and uh, most people, I think, involved, despite minor glitches of a first-time uh, multinational sporting event, uh, know that they're for real. World records are being set. The athletes come. Some of them didn't, but most of them did. What made Seattle go out on a limb before these games even happened the first time? What a gamble you took. Well, again, I think there are, uh, there are a couple of reasons, one of which is the, the idea of international sports competition that really would be open to the Soviet Union and to the United mm -hmm. States. That's an idea that we think is important, and then to bring another 50 or 60 nations together around that, uh, around that competition. Also, I was personally impressed by the, the dynamism, the enthusiasm, and the commitment of the Turner organization as we spent a number of weeks talking with them, there's no question in my mind that there's a strong, strong commitment on the part of the organization to continuing the Goodwill Games and uh, to helping us to make them an absolutely first-class event in Seattle. Now, Seattle, I've been too many times as a sportscaster for uh, basketball, for football at uh, college and professional football, but a lot of folks haven't seen some recent pictures of Seattle. Let's look at some aerial views and some Seattle pictures here and have you talk about them, explain where these are, and, and relate how the Goodwill Games might be happening at this location. Fine. First of all, what a great skyline picture. A shot of the skyline of Seattle and our famous uh, Space Needle there, which you visit a number of times. Yes. These are uh, Seattle commuters there on the ferry going back and forth to the islands uh, a shot of Puget Sound there again our Space Needle as I say this is the way a lot of folks in Seattle commute to to work are on the ferries the monorail running into downtown to Seattle this is of course the Kingdome which will probably be the site of the basketball competition this is the Seattle Center a small stadium that we have uh, there at the center this is a broad shot of the University of Washington campus with Husky Stadium just on the corner. We'll see another shot uh, of the stadium. There it is, and by the time 1990 comes around, there will be another covered deck there on the right-hand side, which will increase the capacity. This is our velodrome in Redmond, Washington, which will be probably rebuilt uh, for the games. And there's a shot of downtown Seattle in the background, uh, Mount Rainier off in the distance. And you get a sense from these shots of the extraordinary beauty of the city of Seattle, which, which you have seen firsthand and which we hope that uh, thousands of athletes from around the world are going to see in 1990. I can't let it get by without asking this question. Why a priest involved as chairman of the host committee, personally and professionally? And, and that's part one of the question. And part two is, uh, what about the reaction to you and the collar in Moscow? Have there been any reactions to that? Well, as, as far as my involvement is concerned, I guess I, I would say, Bob, I consider myself, in addition to being the the president of Seattle University to, to be a citizen of that great community and the opportunity for me and some of the other leadership of the community to be involved in this effort is something that makes a lot of sense. I guess I'd also say that, you know, Catholic priests have been involved in certain goodwill activities over previously the, over, <laughs> over the centuries. Um, and your second question? Oh, uh, Moscow, the reaction oh, sure. to the collar. Uh, much, uh, any, none? Well, actually, as I've been around the last few days, I've just been in casual attire, but uh, I have been here previously, have attended some formal receptions. I guess, frankly, I'd say nobody bats an eyelash. Uh, there, there's a lot of different costumes that you see here That's in true. Moscow, so I don't think it's been any particular... We're about out of time for this yeah. segment, but I have to get to this. Uh, any new sports plan for uh, 1990, and what about Moto Ball? <laughs> <laughs> well, Moto Ball, I'm not sure of. I have been thinking of the fact... You know, nobody's we, sure of it. Nobody's me. sure of it. We uh, thinking, you know, maybe we should do something on Mount Rainier. We could have a Mount Rainier climbing expedition <laughs> with the Americans from one side and the Russians from the other. There are wonderful opportunities, summer skiing in that area. You could do some very interesting exhibition kinds of things, such as you did with the, the skating, that experience. Extraordinarily Big successful hit. program. Uh, there is summer skiing in that area, and who knows, we might do a little bit of that. Thanks for coming to visit us, and we'll be keeping in close contact with you for the next four years. Well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here, and we really do look forward to having the Goodwill Games, our, our Soviet colleagues, and athletes from around the world in the Emerald City in 1990. Thanks for being with us. We'll be right back right after this. Stay with us as we continue coverage of the Goodwill Games late night.
back at some of the more memorable moments in these first Goodwill games. It's incredible to most of us here that the time has already come to look back, but things have been moving very fast ever since we arrived in Moscow. So now we begin a regular series of reports on the highlights of the Goodwill games, which we call Moments of Glory. It was new on the sporting calendar, and it promised to do something that had not been done in 10 years bring American and Soviet athletes together in a multinational sports festival. The start of the Goodwill Games brought the waiting to an end with a touch of irony on July 4th at the Olympic Sports Complex in Moscow. The first medal of the first Goodwill Games was awarded to Angel Myers, who set a new American record in the 50-meter freestyle. The 19-year-old native of America's Georgia went on to win three more golds and a bronze, the most decorated athlete of these games, leading the U.S. team, and especially the women, to heights that few expected them to reach. They were the so-called B team, the team that represented America's second best. But by the time the competition ended, we knew them as the Killer Bees, a team that had swum its way to a new image. There was also the performance of Vladimir Salnikov, the world record holder at 800 and 1500 meters, bettering his own mark in the 800 and serving notice that the Soviets were ready for a showdown. But the swimming events ended with a surprising upset as Sean Killian from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, outtouched the seemingly invincible Salnikov to win the 400 meters, an ending that sharply drew the lines for the U.S.-Soviet confrontation, which would soon develop in other water sports. In diving, much was expected from the highly disciplined Chinese team, but they managed to perform only well enough to win two bronzes and a silver. Nor were the American divers able to seize the moment. Michelle Mitchell settled for the bronze in the women's platform. But it was Angela Stasiolevich who made the most inspired dives and took a bow for the gold. To the frustration of American divers, that scenario was played out again in the men's platform when Harvard's Dan Watson earned the silver, only to be eclipsed by Sergei Gurilev, whose dives resembled sculpture suspended in air. And for that achievement, the gold was his. At the Lennon Stadium open swimming pool, the last of the water sports, water polo, also came down to a dramatic meeting of Soviet and U.S. athletes. After two Olympic boycotts, years of waiting, and four days of international competition, the teams entered the pool. When they came out, the Soviets had won the match 10 to 5, and with it, they received their full measure of recognition as the best in the world. Connor, do you have any specific memory at this point of the games? Anything that stands out in your mind? Well, one of the most uh, memorable moments happened tonight. Uh, Oksana Omelianchek, the Soviet gymnast, she's amazing. She's adorable, first of all, but she is a fantastic gymnast. She was so outstanding in the first three events and then completely fell off the bars as she was making her challenge for the all-around title and had to break down into tears. And I think that all of the American public at that one point said, hey, we identify with this girl who wanted it so badly. She's really young. She'll be back. That achieved a 6.5 on our studio Richter scale, too. We can tell when something has real impact because everybody who's working very hard in the studio stops and looks. When they had a close-up shot of that young girl's face with the tears coming down, it uh, tugged at your heart just a little bit. Yeah. We'll be back in just a moment with more talking with Bart Connor, and we'll also be taking a look at boxing. Stay with us. Two pounds. We're in the lightweight division, and we're going to show you a fight now of Romalis Ellis, who's from Decatur, Georgia. And he's going to be fighting Yuri Savochkin from the Soviet Union. Ellis is a left-hander. He won his first fight over Jose Luis Perez of Venezuela. Savochkin also a very hard hitter, fighting in the true style of the Soviets. Let's go now to the indoor uh, stadium at the Olympic Sports Complex with Don Chevrier and Paul Horning. Well, five more Americans, Paul Horning, will be vying for spots in the gold medal bouts on Saturday here at the uh, Goodwill Games in Moscow. Romanos Ellis is a guy who kind of came out of nowhere, but he's impressed people here. He might have a shot to make it. He's in our first bout tonight. Well, he's from Decatur, Georgia. He's in the first bout, as you say, Don, and I really think that he may be the slight favorite. I talked to Roosevelt Sanders, the coach of the USA boxing team, and he says he thought possible two of the boxing team would be going to and Romalis Ellis, so uh, let's, let's keep our fingers crossed. Ellis up against the tough Soviet here in the first bout of the evening. 
Yuri Savochkin of the Soviet Union is the opponent for Romano Salas of the Keter, Georgia, here in this lightweight semifinal bout. The loser is sure of a bronze medal, but Dallas and his Soviet opponent still in the hunt for gold. That's what they're looking for here, Paul, as they start the first of three rounds here in Moscow before increasingly larger and even more enthusiastic crowd here. Boxing becoming one of the most popular venues of the Goodwill Games. Yes, sir. We'll have over 12 to 13,000 here tonight. Romano Salas, 20 years old, five foot seven and a half, going against the Soviet Yuri Savochkin. And Savochkin defeated a Bulgarian in his first bout. Alice winning his opening bout of the quarterfinals against Jose Luis Perez of Venezuela. He is a southpaw, Romano Salas of the United States, and that may cause some confusion for the 21-year-old Soviet boxer. As is the Soviet. So that's, uh, as I say, they're not accustomed to beating southpaws head-on. Uh, the Soviets, not necessarily. And uh, it could be interesting. It could either be a great bout or a very dull bout with two southpaws in there. Ellis has some experience internationally. He's fought in Australia and in Indonesia. Soviet showing a good jab. The following right was blocked by Ellis. And a soft jab thrown out by Ellis. It was five, seven and a half. He tends to lean toward a pro style of boxing. And if you go too far in that direction, of course, it can cost you here in the amateur rules, the way they score these things. Now, Jimmy Fox made a good point, the executive director of the United States Amateur Boxing Federation. He said, Paul, our boxers have got to get away from counterpunching and take it offensively to them. Take it to them. The United States embarrassed here in a dual meet back in January. 12-0. They lost to the Soviet Union. Already Arthur Johnson and Parker White have made their way to the final. We're looking for more representation for the United States on Saturday, but the Soviets certainly have dominated this boxing competition. And they expect it to because of the decision by the State Department to take nine boxers off the team, six of which were United States champions. That is something that the United States Olympic Committee is very upset about, although this is not their event. They're going to try to ensure that that does not happen any time in the future. Well, Al is feeling his way here against the fellow Southpaw, Yuri Savochkin of the Soviet Union. Alice has had international boxing experience, and it shows here, unlike some of the subs we've had flown into the last minute. But so far, rather uninspiring first round of competition to the final minute of it now. Coming up short with the jab. Alice goes to the body. Still fairly tentative, though, not taking it to him. The Soviet counterpunching there with two good hands. And the Bulgarian referee just out for a walk in the park, letting them do their thing. Don, this would be the last night of the semifinals, and I think if we can get two boxers, two more boxers into the finals, it would be, you know, a very interesting Saturday night. There's a good lap by Ellis. It will be if we can get uh, yeah, good. many as four or five Americans in. Hopefully, it'll be a lively Saturday sure night. Sure will. It'll be a good number, too. It'll be a good showing. It's been a good showing so far for this young and inexperienced boxing team. Neither of these fighters wants to follow after the opening jab, but in the last minute or so, the Soviet, Savochkin has done a better job of that than Ellis now. The time is winding down on the two of them there as the right is thrown by the Soviet. Winding down to the final second of the bell to end round one. Round from Alice, Alice of the United States against Yuri Savochkin of the Soviet Union, the semifinal of the lightweight division. A fairly even first round. We would have to give the edge to the Soviet. He just simply got more done. Not very busy at the part of either fighter in that first round. That's something the Americans have got to do, is generate more activity in the ring. And now the Soviet ready to give Alice all he can handle. Keep the hands moving. It's a 20-point must, must uh, system for the winner of each round. 2019 is usually the score, and it's 2018. You've almost uh, knocked that, the guy out. You right. really outclassed the other guy with the 2018 score. Both have good jabs, like I said on the first round, Paul. The secret here to impress the judges is the following punch of the combinations after the jab. There's a good combination for the Soviet boxer, Zavochkin. Goes to the body, wild to the right hook coming up to the head. He advanced by beating a Bulgarian unanimously in the quarterfinal. He's 21 years old. He won the Soviet Cup in 1985. He keeps that right very low, very low. Look, he's just hanging it down there, inviting a left, the left-hand lead for Ellis. But he brings it up very smartly. Not a heavy jab, but he scores with it. He makes contact right there. Good example with the jab. No following punch for the Soviet. There is Ellis just sort of pity patting out there, sticking the right hand in his face. 
Soviet with an edge in the first round and certainly with the edge and punches thrown and landed here. That's the midway mark of the second round. There's the right thrown by Ellis connecting on the side of the head of the Soviet boxer. Ellis still a little tentative, I think, Paul. Right. He's got to get busier, as they say in amateur circles. You must throw punches. You got to score. When he got three rounds, you sure better win two out of three if you hope to take something home. First round, we feel, went to the Soviet by a slight margin. And he appears to be ahead on points in the second round as well. Romanos Ellis from Decatur, Georgia now. Incumbent upon him it is to open things up. Very the jab, but that's all he's throwing. Very quiet, sophisticated crowd. Of course, they're going to clap and scream a little bit when something happens with the Soviet. That's not your hometown, but... This is not your Las Vegas No, it crowd. really isn't, is it? There's no smoking, there's no... Beer drinking around here. And no thousand dollar ringside seat. No, sir. A couple of rubles and a few Kopecks will get you in here. Well, Ellis Gamely coming on now. Just 20 seconds left in the round. But he is missing with his combination. His jab is about all he has had. Soviet is the heavier puncher of the two. There's a good shot by Ellis now. Two quick rights he threw out there. Caught him with a good combination that time and a good right hand. Now he's getting a little busier. Round. Coming on at the end of it, that's one secret to impressing judges in amateur boxing. At the bell to end round two. We'll return with more Turner Network Television Goodwill Games coverage after this from his approval. Two very close first rounds, but it's possible they could have gone to the Soviet. So Ellis knows he's been told by Roosevelt Sanders, the United States coach, he's got to get busy. Good stiff right thrown by Savochkin there. Ellis a little too tentative for the first couple of rounds, but he came on late in round two, and they mix it up better now, these two southpaws here in the third round. Yeah, Ellis is getting quicker. He knows he's behind a little bit. I'm sure Roosevelt Sanders, the boxing coach, told him that. You've got to get busier, and he's trying to get busier. And he's scoring a lot better. The trouble he has had is his jab will drive the Soviet boxer back, and then he has to lunge with the uh, left hand to try to... Use a combination, quite often misses. See, there's the jab. The jab doesn't even throw the left now. Has it blocked when he does try to throw it on that occasion. But those jabs are good scoring points. A lunging shot with the right hand by Sovachkin. One minute gone in the third round. Ellis fighting for gold or silver medal survival here. The loser gets the bronze. The winner goes on to the gold medal lightweight bout. Ellis with a couple of scoring blows there. Had a chance to work inside, chose not to. Continues to go for the head. Now he's back to the corner. Soviet going oh, staggered coming out of that exchange. Got him with a good left, and he kind of staggered him. He went back. Might have been a standing eight count, but the referee from Bulgaria did not see it that way. I thought sure he was staggered a little bit. That oh. normally would have been a standing eight count. Should have been. See the Soviet look up at the clock now. So you know that he's in trouble. Lunges in with the right hand. He's off back. Got to again. go. Roosevelt Sanders is up, encouraging. Ellis has stunned Sovachkin midway in this third round. He's definitely ahead in the third round. But is it enough, Don? You look at him. He's looking up. He wants this thing over with. The Soviet. I tell you, look. He's still. He's looking up at the clock. It's directly overhead. What time do we go home? He keeps saying. Ellis has got a minute. If he could get a standing eight count, I think he may be able to win this fight. Well, he certainly is winning the round. There is the jab again by Romano Zellos. The, the United is States. The left hand comes tired. through. Now he gets caught. He said he's giving him a break is what he's giving him. He shouldn't have stopped it there. Well, they'll do that. They will intervene. But a tired Soviet boxer as Ellis has come on briskly here in the third round. The Soviet very wild now. The Army Curry he brings going. the left hand up. There's the He's right wild. coming through. He set up, Don. There's the left by Ellis. Sovachkin hanging on now. 25 seconds to go. Oh, he got him with the right, too. I tell you, you got to say something for the Soviet. He's out almost on his feet. He's just fighting out of instinct. He's holding now. Ellis wants to break away. Goes into his dance here. He's feeling pretty good in this third round. It's been a big round for him. Depending on how they scored the first two, he might do all right in this one. Just five seconds to go. Continues to wail away at the Soviet boxer who hangs up. on. He's exhausted. The Soviet boxer's corner. 
That's the bell to the end big of the third round, round. Don. Big round for Romalis Ellis. We'll just have to wait and see. We'll be right back. Okay, very good fight there with Romalis Ellis. He's from Decatur, Georgia, and the Soviet boxer, Yuri Savochkin. And we're going to go to the decision in just a moment to see just what happened with that. As a matter of fact, I think we're ready to take a look at it. And here's the decision now. Romalis Ellis, 132-pounder, lightweight. Romalis Ellis is the winner. And he will advance now with an opportunity to box for the gold for the United States. On Saturday night, to win the gold, Ellis must get past the Soviet, or Zubek Nazarov, uh, who won a bronze at the World Championships. Very popular fighter with the Soviet boxing crowds here, so that ought to be a very good one. And an American boxer who has an opportunity to go for the cold. Not many of them have. As you know, that was the team that was decimated by the Defense Department ban on military personnel participating in the games. Nine had to be replaced, but Ellis fights his way all the way through. He was on the original team, not one of the replacements, and now he will get an opportunity to box for the gold. It is also time for our phrase that pays. I think they say that on the radio. We don't mean that. This is our Goodwill trivia, and it is pronounced Nipuka Nipira. Nipuka Nipira. And Alec, our Soviet cameraman, shakes his head as though that's in the ballpark, Bob, but not exactly right. And it translates literally to neither fuzz nor feather. <laughs> and that means good luck. I guess I wish you neither fuzz nor feather, but smooth sailing. Could that be used in gymnastics, Bart? Could you see going up to somebody before a competition and say, <laughs> neither fuzz nor feather? <laughs> I like it already. I don't know. You said today, by the way, that you saw... Uh, Bud Wilkinson here in Moscow from, I know you went to Oklahoma University. What is Coach Wilkinson doing here of all things? Well, I'll tell you, actually, he is the honorary president of the United States Gymnastics Federation. It seems kind of funny in a way that, uh, you know, one of the greatest football coaches in history uh, is involved with gymnastics, but he worked on the board of directors and he helps in fundraising. And since one of his Oklahoma boys was very popular in gymnastics, he's glad to be helping us. Oh, that's great. You, we were talking about, we just have time for one quick comment from you, and that is about these Goodwill games and the politics. There's been a relative absence of politics during these games. And it's been a delight for us. You know, as, as you know, in my last few years of my career, uh, the 80 Olympics, the 84 Olympics, we did have political problems with boycotts. And, you know, I know these athletes very well, and, and I treat them as friends as they do I. And it's, it's interesting to note that aside from the politics, we get along wonderfully, and we all love an opportunity to compete in major international events like this. So I hope this is a really good step in that direction to keeping that spirit alive. You're a lot of fun to be around. It's been great having you on the program. Thank you. Thanks, Bart Cutter. And we are going to uh, have to leave you now. Late night for day 13 is just about over. I want to remind you, coming up on Friday, men's volleyball, powerful Soviet Union team, U.S. versus France, women's, women's gymnastics, figure skating. On Saturday, men's volleyball, the gold medal match, U.S. USSR. Also boxing, men's basketball for the bronze. And then on Sunday, we'll have weightlifting, rowing, closing ceremony. And mainly, we want you to watch, of course, we want you to watch all of it, the U.S. versus the USSR primetime Sunday night. They'll go for the gold in the World Basketball Championship. For Bart Connor, this is Bob Neal saying Das Badania from Moscow. The Goodwill Games, co-sponsored by Turner Broadcasting System Incorporated, the USSR State Committees for Television and Radio, and for Physical Culture and Sport, are not affiliated in any way with Goodwill Industries of America Incorporated who conduct the Goodwill Industries games in various locations around the world to provide the healthy experience of competition to disabled persons. Turner Broadcasting System Incorporated urges your support of the Goodwill Industries and our games. <laughs>